This is Writing Lessons, and I'm your host, Silas House. In each episode of Writing Lessons, we look at a different topic about creative writing. Today, we're talking about songwriting and the creative process. Our guest for this episode is Carla Gover. Carla grew up in eastern Kentucky and is a veteran of the folk scene. She's performed with everyone from Gene Ritchie to Dirk Powell. Her two most recent albums both reached number one on the folk music DJ charts. She has won first place in the Chris Austin Songwriting Competition at Merlefest, the Careville Folk Festival New Folk Contest, and the Flat Rock Songwriting Festival. Carla has played music all over the world, from Scotland to Mexico to Denmark. She is a widely respected singer, songwriter, and dancer who now lives in Lexington. So first of all, what makes a great song? Well, you know, there's always some element of an X factor with great songs because there are songs that totally follow what we would consider a classic great song formula that are great. And then there are songs that break every single rule and that I would still consider great. But I think having some creative or unique twist on rhyme scheme and not just doing the every night light, the very stereotypical rhymes is something that I respond to, you know, an artist's own creative take on it. So do you mean like you would use more embedded rhymes, like rhymes where they're not expected or? In some instances, yes, embedded rhymes. I mean, I don't mind a good rhymed couplet, mm-hmm. but there are certain words that just you are used. You want to surprise the over listener. And over again, yeah. So an unexpected twist. I love it when songwriters do something different with the rhyme scheme than I'm expecting. And the really great songwriters can be using a really unusual rhyme scheme and you don't even notice it because it Mm -hmm. all just flows so well. And then you stop to analyze and you're like, oh my gosh, that's kind of really weird and different. And I never would have thought to do it that way. And for me, there's a special magic that happens when when the song lyrics... And sort of what I would call the emotional vibration, or sometimes I even call it the emotional code of the song, match up. Those are the truly magical songs Mm -hmm. that persist in popularity for decades or even hundreds of years. And again, it's so hard to talk about songwriting. Uh, Maybe for me, it's even more difficult to talk about songwriting than other art because it is just such a wide field of creativity and so many different songwriters and so many different approaches. But I think we can all agree that there are certain songs that there's just this magical alchemy that happens between the lyrics and the music and the way they fit together. Like the the music exalts what the song lyrics are saying and just sends it straight out of the singer's mouth and fingers into the heart of the listener. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, you sort of have to to know a formula. You sort of have to know, quote unquote, how to write a song to get to the point where it is organic and it is magic. Would you agree with that? In general, yes. When you set out to have a dedicated study of any artistic field, and I tell this to my students all the time, whether I'm teaching songwriting or dance, you learn the rules, and then you learn how to break them. Exactly. With songwriting, though, for so many of us, our school of songwriting, for me, my school of songwriting was sitting on my big brother's bed between his two speakers when I was like three and four years old and putting those discs on the turntable and listening just over and over, and that's, that's the first school of songwriting. And so if we're fortunate enough to grow up around songwriters and Also, in my case, I I heard a lot of ballads, and there's some really beautifully constructed songs in the body of Appalachian traditional music. I think sometimes you absorb some of those things intrinsically without knowing. It's like when you speak your native language, you don't, you use the rules without knowing what they are. Right. So I'm going to ask you a question that I think most artists don't love to be asked. What is your process? Well... I know when a lot of people ask that, it's what comes first, the the music or the lyrics and things like that. But for me, this is what I've learned over time. Some songs 
you're wrestling them to the ground with blood, sweat, tears, cussing. In some songs, it's like the angel dropped it right into your head, and you're just taking dictation almost down to Mm -hmm. the rhymes. You don't even have to think about it. But what I have learned about process, and this is crucial for, for all creators and everyone that I admire as a prolific and or gifted creator has this in common, is you don't wait for inspiration to strike. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you get those little ideas, I've developed a, a nice, simple system of note taking. I just write down the hook. I write down the idea and I have a regular practice and I sit down even when I don't know what I'm going to write. Because if you're waiting for um, inspiration to strike and then you sit down and then you do your process and you write your lyrics and then you write whatever you know your process exactly may be, I think just showing up at your creative space is the most important part of the process yeah. and creating in quantity. Yeah. If I waited for something to strike, <laughs> I would never get anything written. Yeah. You have to just put your butt in the chair and write. That's one of the keys to it, isn't it? It really is. I think for anybody that truly wants to come into the fullest expression of their creativity in whatever field it is, but the other part of that is just keeping your antenna up, don't you think? Like, I'm sure that you're always moving through the world and listening and watching and, you know, as a songwriter. Absolutely. Yeah, everything becomes fodder for it and, you know, conversations or things that you observe in nature, things you see on the wall, people you see interacting at a coffee shop, it's all fodder. And that's another part of my process that I find really important is finding that handful of activities that light me on fire, that make me glad to be alive, that connect me with what a miracle it is to be here because, you know, the world is burning down around us. Mm -hmm. And there is something that I think everybody feels, whether they're an artist or not, is like, what does it mean for me to get up and go to work every day when people are suffering, Mm -hmm. when there's genocide, when there's climate change that we're all um, struggling with and that people are suffering and yet... It is a miracle Mm -hmm. to be here. It is a gift to be alive, and I can't think of anything better to do with my time. To bring beauty into the world, art. Bring beauty into the world and try to develop my gifts to the fullest extent Mm -hmm. possible. You know, when I'm talking about any kind of creative process, I think that conscientiousness that you're talking about is key to it, right? It's about empathy. You You have to have that empathy, to be an artist, to articulate those abstract emotions. So you're doing that in a song or a novel or a poem or whatever, if it's art. Yes, and there's this really interesting process. Uh, It's kind of a balance between you're creating art for yourself, first and foremost. You're creating art that feels in alignment and in integrity with what you believe, with what you feel. But at the same time, you are imagining your listener. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about your, your audience. You're thinking about friends or or family members or just other citizens of the world that maybe will feel the same way. And for me, that balance even extends to the balance between my desire to just create for the pure joy of creation and the fact that I'm a professional artist who makes my entire living through my creative endeavors. And I do have to think about that, that market force and the sales and things like that, which I know a lot of artists just run screaming, you know, holding up their hands in the form of a cross away from, I don't want to be commercial, but we, it's just the reality. And whether you're Michael Jackson or Taylor Swift, those great artists that we admire so much are thinking about those things Mm -hmm. and balancing it in their work. And so. Well, you got to make money to make art, right? I mean, you have to eat to be able to be an artist. You do. (laughs) And if you decide to try to work a regular job, which I, you know, Everybody has their own path and their own process, so it's not like I think there's just one way to do it. But for me, if I had to work a full-time job, I would be too tired to create my art. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you have to make enough money to have a little bit in the bank and and be able to eat so that you can create. I do think that's something that some people get hung up on is this idea that that art should be free for everybody and all that. I find that offensive as an artist because, to me, it negates art. I think the thing is, there's a real difference between I have to eat to make my art and like capitalism run amok that is just pure greed. There's a big difference between those two things, right? 
And but I think a lot of times, you know, people will see some huge pop star that's making a billion dollars, and then they'll also put that on, you know, an independent artist who's just trying to sell a CD <laughs> at a show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of us have critiques for many, many aspects of capitalism, but we all also are faced with the fact that we need to eat and have a place to mm -hmm. live, and we have to find ways to participate in the economy that feel in alignment for us. And uh, I guess that's what the Buddhists would call right livelihood. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what I see. Well, if you had to choose one perfectly written song, what would it be? Well, I really love Dolly Parton's to daddy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I mention it because everybody mentions I will always love you and Jolene. And mm -hmm. obviously Dolly is just a master of the craft of songwriting. It pours out of her. I'm pretty sure she probably just learned from that school of listening mm -hmm. to what she heard on the radio and, and around her and her family. But you know, one way to create a beautiful song is to tell a story from uh, the point of view of an unlikely narrator mm -hmm. and so it's a song about um a child witnessing her parents marriage and mm -hmm. witnessing her mother's unhappiness of which her father was unaware mm -hmm. so um and that brings it a, a whole other level than if the the wife was telling the story right like there's a whole different level of emotion more layers of emotion because it's from the child's point of view yes it brings the emotionality of it to the forefront when you see it through the eyes of a mm -hmm. child. Right. What about her rhyme scheme in that? What's going on there? Because it always comes back at the end, right? There's a refrain of to daddy. To daddy. And so like, it's almost like the to daddy ends up being something different than what you think it's going to be going into it. Don't you think that that's another thing that makes it a really smart song? Yes. And that's actually, that's a, classic device in country mm -hmm. is when you they bring it around so that the chorus means something different or in this case the refrain means something different yeah. the first time you hear it then when you hear it at the end it's it's poignant because there's layers of meaning that get stacked up but yeah she's not following any kind of classical rhyme scheme there now that i think about it mm -hmm. um it's it's a refrain song and that's that's kind of one of the cool things about a refrain song because mm -hmm. it can free you up from some of the um, conventions of a rhyme scheme this one came up for me recently that I think is just a perfectly written, perfectly executed song um, is One Headlight by Jacob Dylan. Mm -hmm. Just because... It's so singable. It's singable. It just totally puts you in a place. It gives you an emotion. The la the layers of the production are excellent too, which is kind of a separate thing mm -hmm. than the, the songwriting itself. So I guess maybe that one would be my top choice for... Songwriting plus production. Your cover of Girls Just Want to Have Fun totally changed that song for me. You know, because, I mean, growing up in the 80s, it, it was thought of as just such a, you know, fun bop and all that. But you bring such poignancy to the song. You're using all the same words, all that. How did you change it in that way and draw out the different the meaning that was already there, but you're drawing it out in a way that just makes it more obvious to me as a listener. Well, maybe with that one, it's just because of the differences in the way that I grew up and the way that Cindy Lauper grew up, even though she didn't write that song. Mm -hmm. um, it was written by a man, but for me, thinking about having those, the conversation with you know my mom, saying, when are you going to live your life right? It, the religion that I grew up with and me mm -hmm. starting to kind of move away from the evangelical ideas that I grew up with uh, and that, and then putting it into a claw hammer banjo mm -hmm. framework switched up a lot, but there was a lot of restriction in the religion I grew up with and the religion of my grandmother. And there were a lot of things you couldn't do if you were a girl that girls couldn't mm -hmm. do that I wanted to do. I wanted to dance. I wanted to wear well, riches. <laughs> I but, wanted to wear lipstick. Yeah. But when you, decided to cover that song did you know like that you were doing a different interpretation of it or is that the way you had always heard that song even when Cindy Lauper sang it I don't think I heard it that way when Cindy Lauper sang it but it lived in my mind and my heart and I was just kind of noodling around one night and it came out on my banjo and then I realized that that's what it would mean to me if I sang it and I think if it comes across as somehow 
having a different interpretation. It's just because that's how I'm feeling when I mm-hmm. sing it. Right. Well, you know, I have always loved Cindy Lauper. She's one of my favorites. So no shade on her. No. But it just gave that song a whole new life for me, the way that you do it. I just love the way you interpreted it. And um, it's, I always say you shouldn't cover a song unless you're going to make it new. And I think you really did that with that song. No, thanks. Well, if there's one songwriter in particular that you think of as the master of the form, I mean, you already mentioned Dolly being one of those, but is, is there somebody else in particular? Well, again, you know, it's going to be a different answer on a different day. But I will tell you that one songwriter that I've seen live three times who consistently surprises me when I stop to analyze what he writes is Jackson Brown. Hmm. Because he he's always trying new things. Uh, and, and his rhyme schemes in particular just, just blow me away. Because when it's like what I was mentioning earlier, when you are listening to certain Jackson Brown songs, you're not thinking about the fact that it's this really unusual creative rhyme scheme that has rhymes that are occurring at different points and then bringing you back to them three lines later when you weren't expecting it mm-hmm. until you stop to analyze it. And then he just, he's a master of a bridge. You know, mm-hmm. Jackson does an amazing bridge where he kind of says something that's related to what the song itself started out saying, but it kind of also brings in a different idea and he switches up the, the chords or the melody you know, on those mm-hmm. bridges. I just really admire his writing. For all the aspiring songwriters out there, talk about the importance of a bridge. Well, not all songs have them. I don't think you absolutely have to have them. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule that you always have to go with, but I do try to put them in some of my songs. Why? Um, Why do you want to put them in there? Well, it gives your ear something different to hear, get different to listen to. As I just mentioned, it can bring in a different idea that's closely related to the ideas you've been exploring in the main song, but just put a different twist on it. Yeah. I know that's like a constant thing that I have heard, like, you know, people who are trying to write songs, they talk about the bridge. Well, if you're (laughs) trying to do the radio formula, the Nashville radio formula, you have to have a bridge. But Yeah. Well, so many of the best songwriters I know are also voracious readers. So... How has literature informed your work as a songwriter or not? Oh, I'm absolutely a voracious reader. I'm reading all the time. And now, since my new habit since the pandemic is also listening to books. Mm -hmm. So I can be almost reading almost all of my waking hours now. I love it so much. For me, I don't always write songs that are like inspired by a book that I've read Mm -hmm. directly or characters. In fact, I've done that very rarely. But what reading is for me, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of those things that fills my cup. Going outside, being in nature, just being with a handful of friends and family, sitting in in my studio, giving myself that writing time, but also consuming songs and books, um, memoirs, um, books, nonfiction books. It's constantly filling my cup and it's, keeping my mind alive and keeping my heart on fire and keeping me mindful of what a miracle it is to be here in this world and keeping me engaged with the world and the people around me. And that is where my best art comes from when I am on fire to be alive. I'm just, just happy to be here. and so grateful to get to pursue my art as my living. And I think reading is just something that helps me be more alive. Yeah, this is something I always tell people in my writing classes is if I go see a film and I leave there and it makes me want to write, then I, I appreciate that. Sometimes, you know, if I'm listening to music and it makes me want to write or I read a poem and it makes me want to work on my novel, art begets art. I think not enough artists take advantage of all the art in the world. I think sometimes like the novelist I know only look to the novel when they are writing and I'm looking to everything, photography, painting, music, dance, whatever, you know, it's all a part. It feeds the artistic spirit, right? So it's the same thing you're saying. Yeah, I feel the same exact way. And also I think it's of note that it's not just the wonderful, great art 
that can mm -hmm. inspire this. Yes. You've probably heard me tell the story of being in the audience uh, when there was a band who was playing. They were from Vermont, and they were dressed up like what they thought hillbillies dressed mm -hmm. like, and they were singing songs about pills and moonshine and violence. Every song was like this dark Appalachia, and I sat in the audience watching that band and started me in the Redbird River, which mm -hmm. is a tribute to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so even the art that we don't necessarily like or resonate with or think is wonderful can light that fire too. Yeah. I never thought of me and the Redbird River as a sort of protest song, but it's, it can be seen that way, right? It's like, the, this is what it really is. That song is so authentic and there's so many it's so specific, mm -hmm. you know? I think that's part of why that authenticity comes through so clearly because mm -hmm. the details mm -hmm. are so perfect in it and it conjures the place. I guess especially like in country music and folk music, sense of place might have more of a role in songwriting, do you think? Or not? I think probably. I mean, there's certainly a lot of tradition in country music of being very descriptive of images. And, you know, there's the rocking chair where she sat. And there's the, you know, there's the kitchen where we had our coffee together. Um, in a way that sometimes rock and pop music is more about the moment. It's like, we're here, we're going to dance, we're mm -hmm. going to party. You know, right. it's more about the feeling of the moment and just connecting with vitality. And, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, that's not a hard and fast thing. But in general, I mean... Appalachian art in general, and maybe rural art is more connected to a sense of place. Another thing that I always try to get aspiring writers to do is attend conferences and classes and festivals and things like that to surround themselves with other artists and to, you know, to seek the instruction of people who are making it happen. One place that you have done that is the Cowan Creek Mountain Music School. Yeah, so I am the artistic director for the Cowan Creek Mountain Music School. This is my final year in that position because we rotate through positions. And even though our primary focus is on uh, preserving and passing on the traditional fiddle and banjo repertoire of Eastern Kentucky, we also often have a class that features songwriting. Mm -hmm. And so this year we have Jerry Catherine Howell, mm -hmm. who is a longtime student yeah. of Cowan. She'll be teaching songwriting. We're going to have... Uh, Marlon Obando Solano from Appalachian. Mm -hmm. uh, he's from Nicaragua, and he's a great songwriter in his own sort of Latin American folk traditions. He's going to be down there teaching some songwriting stuff. And they're just, every year, whether we're offering a songwriting class or not, there are great songwriters from traditional right. music like Don Rogers and John Herod and Sarah Kate Morgan who and Carly Don Milner, mm -hmm. who are have drunk from that deep well of those Eastern Kentucky traditional tunes. And so even if you're just there taking a fiddle or banjo class, um, I submit to you that it would be beneficial right. for songwriters because that's the well that we're all drinking from here in Kentucky. And, you know, we have so much great music coming from here. Um, as I know you agree with me 100% on that. And to the point where sometimes people say must be something in the water, right. but there's something in the traditional music of Eastern Kentucky. It just permeates everything, the fiddle and the banjo tunes and the ballads that, uh, that shape us all. Do you have an exercise or a prompt you know, that you can easily explain to people in just a minute or two? Absolutely. I have two things that I recommend to people that are aspiring writers or songwriters. The first one I got from Ray Bradbury, hmm. the fiction writer, because I'm a big sci-fi fan. I hmm. love to read sci-fi. And he always kept a list of titles of potential short stories. Mm -hmm. And he kept a running list. And when he would sit down with a typewriter and he didn't know what he was going to type, he would just pick whatever title spoke to him. So that's one thing I do. Another thing I like to do is a songwriting exercise I got from a Nashville songwriter named Pat Pattison, who he calls it object writing. And what you do is you set the timer for 10 minutes and then you pick a subject, any subject, but often memories work well like, Oh, a photo from your granny's mm -hmm. house or being on the porch somewhere, any porch. And then you try to use all five senses plus your kinesthetic sense, like, mm -hmm. you know, the prickle on the back of your neck kind of sense. And you write as long as you can for 10 minutes. And then, then you just push stop and you stop writing. It's really important that even if you still have ideas that you stop writing 
when the timer goes off. Or you can do it for seven minutes, whatever works mm-hmm. for you. And if you do that every morning when you're in a season where you're trying to write songs or write anything really, it kind of gets this write us, interrupt us thing going. And so then your brain is kind of switched onto that mode yeah. and it puts you in that noticing, like you were talking about earlier, that uh, mm-hmm. alertness and that noticing attitude that we need to cultivate as artists. Yeah, I'm a, I'm an evangelist for short exercises and prompts. Mm-hmm. There's just some magic that happens when you have dedicated time in a short space. Stuff just comes to you. Yeah, and it's because you don't have infinite choices mm-hmm. that makes it easy. Uh, I just love what John Hartford would say, too, is that style is based on limitations. Mm-hmm. And so that's true of just your mm-hmm. overall style as a musician, but when you're also trying to create, putting some limits on it, some constraints is helpful. Writing Lessons is an initiative of the 2024-2025 Kentucky Poet Laureate. That's me, Silas House. I'm thankful for the support of the Kentucky Arts Council, the Carnegie Center for Literacy and Learning, the Office of Governor Andy Bashir and Kentucky Humanities. This show is written, recorded, edited, and produced by me. I hope you will share the show with other writers, students, or anyone who is interested in the creative process. Please subscribe to our show, and if you like it, I hope you'll leave a review or a five-star rating. That'll help us get the show to more listeners. Thanks so much for listening to Writing Lessons.